I'd like to talk about what is typically an inverted pendulum type of problem that's sitting on a movable cart. So typically when we talk about that, we're talking about a cart that has wheels or some friction that obviously the friction makes the wheels itself move uh, because without friction, wheels don't go anywhere. But it at least allows to do that. We have this cart, we have an external force that we can push in the horizontal direction, in which case I'm calling it Y in this case. Um, calling it Y because I don't want to interfere with eventually we're going to create our state variables, which are X, so in the control system, so we don't want to do that. And this cart has a mass large M. It also then has an inverted pendulum with a mass small M at the top. Uh, basically, this the mass and the moment of inertia of the uh, uh, of this sort of rod is going to be considered basically not important. It's basically just going to be the mass at the top there. And then we see what we have here when we put this together. Um, there's a couple different ways people look at this, this this length of length L. Some people will include there's a whole moment of inertia. Some people will build other things into it. We'll build springs into this, into a, a wall. It, this, this is a problem that's surprisingly quite useful and is a prototype for many, many different problems. And you might say, do I ever find this problem practically useful? And if you've ever seen a Segway, um, that's basically what this is. And there's a bunch of other related kinds of questions that you see of this all over the place. So looking at this inverted pendulum on a cart problem, which we have some initial starting parameters, we could have picked a whole range of them. These are pretty typical ones that people like to use. Um, and to be fair, this is not a problem that I made up clearly out of my own. So many people really care about this question. And so there's many different forms and flavors and discussions and ways that this gets done. Well, we want to talk about what is sort of a straightforward approach of this and then what happens when I start looking at some just basic control measures as I work through this. So if I start by looking at in the, in the y direction, I can start off with one equation horizontally, uh, which notice this is an equation that is nonlinear. It has the core acceleration of the elements. It has friction, um, which is basically pushing back on it. So it's a damping term. You have forces from the pendulum itself and the applied force. You also will have a structure that's perpendicular to the pendulum, uh, which then basically you're able to group ML out of this, which is the little m and the L out of that. Uh, so this one actually reduces fairly directly to at least a fairly mod modular equation. This, and of course is linear right from the beginning, this structure here turns out to be actually not just it turns out to be nonlinear, but I can play with the cosine and the sine immediately. And this is very helpful because I know that cosine is a pro, you know, because we're going to be looking at well, a couple of different steady states, but the key thing that you care about is theta near zero. This one we kind of know is unstable. You go just a little bit either way, it's going to fall off, right? This is why we actually care about controlling it. Um, but that's the steady state we want to work around. And so what we find is, okay, for cosine theta, um, I, you know, cosine theta around theta equals zero, you know, is going to be one. So I just get just the double derivative. Yay, I know how to work with that. And the second thing is for sine of theta, that's approximately theta. And theta times a squared term gives me actually a cube term. So if I look at this, I'm like, this is a cubic term. If I'm looking at linear terms, that means I'm going to get a small derivative term squared and a small term. So it's a very, very, so it's a very, very small term. So I'm going to be able to ignore that. And I'm left with this equation here. Now, from this equation and this equation, I need to do some rearranging to actually be able to put this um, into a classic form. But a pretty classic approach that's done with this um, eventually takes these two equations, some rearranging is done. And then I define x equal to y dy dt theta d theta dt. So basically I'm taking the y position and the angle position. So that means the y position and the angle. And I'm going to look at both of those and its derivative. And I'm just going to write down the equations. This tends to be very useful and very straightforward. And one such formulation looks like this. Funny thing is, depending on how I play with the, uh, the equations, I get different formulations. 
This is equivalent to basically saying I'm doing different sort of matrix transforms and then play that through the whole system. Again, you know you can do that through different um, kinds of linear systems. So be it here. Okay. So once you do that, this is your system. You can insert some values. And we're going to look at this particular linear system and ask some questions about this linear system, um, and which is a fairly manageable for the order system to play with. Um, if you look at its eigenvalues, some interesting things come out of this. And this is something probably for a longer discussion at some point. But notice that the eigenvalue for this, uh, one of them is zero. And then three others, you've got two minus and a plus. Now, the zero one doesn't affect in terms of stability because the positive one pretty much says this is unstable. We know this is unstable intuitively, but mathematically it definitely says that this is unstable with two other stable eigenvalues. So maybe that says I've got along one trajectory is something I need to stabilize. So then the question is, all right, can I make this system stable? Well, let's see. Uh, the way I would ask this question is I would say, if I have all state variables, all four state variables, I have sensors that are all four of them, and I'm using this force to control it, is that sufficient? Well, I use a controllability matrix, and the controllability matrix I would get here would then give me, uh, I, you know, I get four different row levels on this. And then the first question I ask is, what is the rank? And the rank I get of this is four. And you're like, cool, that means if it's full rank, which is rank of four, or at least as many as the rows, because this doesn't have to be four by four, it could have been four by something longer. As long as I have that, like, all right, I can do it. I do have a whole range of eigenvalues here. Funny enough, two are very strong and two are a lot smaller. And this is something that you want to would want to pay attention to in practice because the angles that might be smaller might in fact be the ones that you need to control on. And so you will you pay attention to this as you start to build your controller and sort of controller into the system. So this is what you pay attention to. Some directions will be easier to control than others. You hope it's this for the it's this one. It may not be, and that's what you have to watch for. And you look at the eigenvectors and look where that's going. The second question is, I'd like to be able to use a single sensor because, well, I don't want to put twenty. I don't want to put a lot of sensors around. Um, sensors are usually less expensive than actuators, so maybe I could do more. But just hypothetically, say I don't really feel like putting sensors around and I want to just build it. So where should I put the sensor? Good question, right? Well, if I want to put one sensor, where am I going to put it? Well, I've got a couple different options. I could put it for easily, I could put it in position, put it in the derivative position, which is velocity. I could put it in the angle or I could put it in the change of the angle. And I could look at all four of those options, right? Well, here's an interesting thing with this. If I take it where I use look at position, just y, um, that turns out to be the best solution because if I use that, that gives me a rank of four for my observation matrix. And this is a case of saying, you know, from you know from what I have from my A matrix and then the resulting C, which generates my output, my single output, can I still see everything? And if I have it as one, if I use that one, I can. If I use any of the other three, my rank is not four, it's only three. So I could use a combination of two sensors even, and that might be very valuable, but I have to have at least one here, and that's the only option I, I'm given to make that work. And so if I'm making a single sensor, that's what I would build. If I do two sensors, I could build the whole control system around that. But this gives you a sense of what happens when you start from this problem and you work your way through a very sort of traditional approach and look at the initial controllability and um, observability matrix. There's a lot you can do with this problem and a lot that one can dig into, uh, but this kind of gets the conversation started.